Welcome, everyone, to a new episode of the Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro Podcast. I am your host, Toby Passman. On the show with us today, we have a very special guest, Dr. Brant Courtright. Dr. Courtright is a professor emeritus with the California Institute of Integral Studies, an author, and a clinical psychologist. He has written four books, two number one international Amazon bestsellers, Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive Decline, as well as the Neurogenesis Diet and Lifestyle. He is featured, a featured speaker at conferences and corporate gatherings on the topics of peak brain performance, cognitive enhancement, preventing cognitive decline, anxiety, and depression. He also sees psychotherapy clients in his San Francisco office. His orientation is holistic and integral, and he integrates the two major streams of depth therapy, contemporary psychodynamics and existential humanistic approaches, together with somatic and functional approaches to psychological healing and growth. So, uh, Dr. Corey, super happy to have you on the show today. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Toby. So, what originally got you interested in kind of just the career path that you went down? Well, I was always interested in human transformation. Um, in college, I was a philosophy major, then a psych major, um, and really putting together psychology and spirituality has, was a big focus for much of my life. Um, I taught in the field of transpersonal psychology at the graduate level for a few decades, um, wrote a couple of textbooks in that area, and I began to feel like in the past 10 years or so that I had kind of de-emphasized or underestimated the effects of the body and the brain on all of this. So, you know, in psychology and psychiatry, there's a kind of ongoing debate, like, like to take depression, for example. Psychiatrists and the medical community see depression as a medical condition, a brain dysfunction that requires lifelong medication to treat. The psycholo psychological community sees depression as unskillful behavior and the results of which produce the brain changes that are seen in depression. So which comes first? It's a chicken or egg question. And most of my life, I've been in the psych psychological side of this, that probably 80% of it is, is that. Well, I've come to really think of it as a chicken and egg thing, that they're both involved, that actually the brain has exposure to so many neurotoxins in the environment that there's been a general weakening of the brain for just about everybody in the, in, in the world, but especially the developed world. And there's also been psychological wounding and psychological um, neurotoxins as well. So this book, Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive Decline, tries to put these two worlds together of brain health holistic, nutritionally focused, especially increasing and strengthening, healing the brain, because there are common neural mechanisms underneath anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline, together with psychology, because there are very different psychological processes involved with anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline. So it tries to put these two worlds together, and that's where my attention has been focused. And I've been most surprised when I've found that my clients, some of them get much better simply through changing their diet and strengthening their brain. That has shocked me and made me really think it's a chicken and egg world we're living in. Um, and of course, psychiatric medications don't heal the brain. They basically suppress the symptoms. So I think we need to go outside of the traditional psychiatric paradigm um, to really look to what can actually heal the brain 
from the many, many neurotoxic assaults that are happening every day in this world. And you mentioned the, the importance of, of diet and have you seen your, a lot of your patients get well through improvements in their diet. And I you know you wrote a whole book on talking about uh, the neurogenesis diet and lifestyle. Yeah. Can you first uh, tell me a little about um, and tell the listeners what neurogenesis is and, and how it relates to diet? Sure. So <clears throat> it used to be thought that the brain stopped growing after we hit our early 20s. And then it was just one slow die off. But then they discovered about 20 years ago that actually the brain makes new brain cells throughout our entire lifetime until the day we die. That process is called neurogenesis, the generation or the genesis of new neurons. And that is in addition to synaptogenesis or neuroplasticity. Right? But they've known about neuroplasticity for 50, 60 years now, which is the brain making new connections among existing neurons. Neuroplasticity is important, but also neurogenesis is important. At first, they didn't realize the significance of neurogenesis. And then they discovered that actually, when your neurogenic rate slows down, then you get things like anxiety, depression, brain fog, cognitive decline. The hippocampus, which is this crescent moon shaped structure in the brain, is the part of the brain that grows new brain cells. And part of it goes into the cognitive portion of the brain and processes new memories. It doesn't store new memories, but it processes new memories. It allows new memories to form. So in Alzheimer's, for example, that massively attacks the hippocampus. So the person can't make new memories. And as their memories disappear, they begin to kind of fade away, right? There's a kind of blank look that happens. Memory is kind of like the, the foundation of the self. When that goes, the self begins to go too. So part of it is cognitive. The other part of it is emotional regulation, particularly the regulation of anxiety and depression. So when our neurogenic rate slows down, meaning the rate at which we make new brain cells and the rate at which we make new connections, when that slows down, we get symptoms, anxiety, depression, chronic stress, brain fog, dementia, cognitive decline. And it turns out that diet has a lot to do with this. There's other factors as well. So what we want is a brain that's growing, right? That, that's, the neurogenic rate is high. Um, and there are many things in our environment that slow it down. So if you look at Wikipedia under neurotoxins, you'll find 200 pages of lists of neurotoxins, 30, paid, 30 um, neurotoxins per page, each which has its own Wikipedia page. That's 6,000 neurotoxins that are in the environment that are brand new, that have never been there before. The brain is being exposed to massive amounts of neurotoxins. Some of these we know about, like mercury, for example. Very, very powerful neurotoxin. Eating a large amount of fish is a disaster for the brain, particularly big fish. Smog is another one. Something like 80% of the world's population lives in smoggy areas. And the really fine particles, the two micron particles and smaller in smog, enter the lungs, enter the bloodstream, and cross the blood-brain barrier where they act like little wrecking balls to the very delicate neurons of the brain, creating inflammation and oxidation. There are some researchers that believe that 30% of Alzheimer's can be chalked up to smog and polluted air. Another big neurotoxin that very few people know about, probably you and your listeners, many of your listeners know about it, is glyphosate, which is the pesticide in Roundup. 
Best glyphosate is the most widely used pesticide in the history of the planet. 300 million pounds of it in the United States every year. It's in certain parts of the Midwest and the South, it's used so much that it's in the dust. It's in the rainwater. UCSF did a study a few years ago and found out that 92% of Americans have measurable levels of glyphosate in their bloodstream. So glyphosate is not only an antibiotic, and so it wipes out the microbiome, which we know is a disaster, but it also opens up the tight junctions of the intestines. Now the tight junctions are what keep out the bad stuff and let in the good stuff. When those open up, neurotoxins, all sorts of toxins come flooding into the body, creating inflammation, and the blood-brain barrier responds to the same molecular signals as the tight junctions of the intestines. So the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier also open up, letting in toxins, creating inflammation. We know that inflammation is behind most of the chronic diseases, right? Cardiovascular disease, involved in Alzheimer's, different cancers, um, diabetes. Um, Cancer or uh, inflammation, chronic inflammation is a silent killer. And it slows the neurogenic rate way, way down. When you have high levels of inflammation, your neurogenic rate is way slowed. So we can spend this entire podcast really focusing on all the different neurotoxins in the environment. It's death by a thousand cuts. Right? We don't notice one or two or even 20 or 30, but after 100 or 200, we begin to buckle and the neurogenic rate slows and we begin to experience symptoms. So what the book does is really go into what I call the healthy brain diet, which has four basic pillars, neurogenic, ketogenic or high fat, high good fat and low carb, anti-inflammatory and gut friendly. All of this, of course, meaning be, being in an organic context, you want to get organic food whenever possible. If you eat organically, you'll cut out at least 80% of the glyphosate. Um, again, in certain parts of the world, you're going to get it in the air, but um, eating organically is the single best thing you can do to improve your health. So these four pillars, neurogenic, ketogenic, anti-inflammatory, gut friendly, boost the neurogenic rate and begin to heal the brain from the kind of weakened state that it currently is in. Because when the brain weakens, the self also becomes more fragile. It becomes more fragmentation prone, more susceptible to fragmenting into shame, anxiety, guilt, um, those things in particular, and then also going further into anxiety and depression. Um, so ideally we'll work with both sides, the brain health side, and the psychological side to work with the wounds, the psychological wounds as well. But again, sometimes people can work with one or the other and still get a good result. Let's talk about as far as some of the, the psychological side of anxiety and depression. You know, you kind of approach it from a, a holistic perspective. Um, and can you tell me a little about just uh, um, in terms of the, the specific types of uh, sort of approaches you use, the uh, contemporary, psychodynamic, and existential humanistic? Uh, can you talk to me a little about what those are? Sure, sure. So in psychology, there is cognitive therapy and cognitive psychology, which deals with our thoughts and how the thoughts influence our feelings. 
And then there are two major streams of depth psychology. Depth psychology means you believe there's an unconscious, that there's more going on than just our conscious thinking. So cognitive therapy is great, but it tends to be superficial for most people. Um, most people need a kind of deeper, more thoroughgoing um, exploration and healing of their wounding. And so the contemporary psychoanalytic approach looks at how the self is fundamentally relational and how we are born into and grow up and develop in a relational matrix. Our family originally, also the larger culture. And we tend to internalize these early object relations, these early attachment, um, attachment patterns that we develop. Um, and those after the age five or six become pretty well ingrained and don't change much the rest of our lives unless we do some sort of psychological work. So what happens is that we tend to seek out, for example, romantic partners who are unavailable in the same way that my mother was or my father was. We think it's a different but this underlying template says, aha, out of a room of 200 people, the unconscious is unerring. It can go right to the person who is unavailable in that same way. So contemporary psychoanalysis looks at how we can change our relational patterns, how we can heal these early woundings and develop more relational freedom in order to be able to be with people, friends, colleagues, lovers, who really see us, who really get who we are, and who value us, who love us for who we are. And also about strengthening the self, right? That the self, because of its wounds, is kind of like a Swiss cheese. It's got all these holes in it that are covered over with defensive structures. So in psychodynamic therapy, these defensive structures erode over time and the early wounding comes to the surface. As we heal that, new self-structure forms and the self becomes more coherent, more cohesive, more solid. That's one stream of depth psychology. The other stream is the humanistic existential stream. And it really looks at how feelings emerge somatically out of our bodily felt experience. Right? For Freud, feelings were mental events. But for Wilhelm Reich, who was one of Freud's most brilliant pupils, he said feelings come out of the body. And contemporary neuroscience research supports this, that the right brain and the left brain process feelings differently. The left brain, the dominant hemisphere, processes feelings according to language, according to a narrative. But before the left brain can do that, it needs to find out from the right brain what we're feeling. And the right brain gets feelings out of a primary body sense that happens in our torso. So what happens when we're wounded is not only do we develop these um, kind of as if personality structures and um, avoidances, but we also dissociate from the body. In order to deal with unbearable pain, emotional pain that as a two-year-old or a four-year-old we can't take, we move into our heads. We dissociate into, a, into an astral plane, into a mental space. And so we leave our body. And so most people, since pretty much everybody is wounded to some degree, most people are kind of dissociated from their bodies. They're this, they experience themselves as this mind walking around in this body, as opposed to being this embodied being. And so what the humanistic existential approach is trying to do is to bring us back into our body, to feel what we are feeling. And in that process, we come back into the here and now. We come back into this present moment. We see how our breathing is involved 
in suppressing feelings, right? We hold our breath. This happens just unconsciously to squeeze down feelings, to turn down the feeling level. And there are these chronic muscular patterns called character armor that we squeeze and hold ourselves in. So most people, most kind of normal neurotics, which is 90% of the population, is uptight to some degree. It's sort of squeezing themselves in, holding themselves down. And so the humanistic existential schools work somatically and in the here and now to really bring attention to what we are feeling, how we are feeling it energetically in the body, expanding our energetic tolerance for feelings, and in the process, coming back into an embodied existence where we really see the world around us. We really feel the chair we're sitting in. We really experience the world around us in an embodied way. So both of those ways of working access deep unconscious material, right? These early wounds aren't available to introspection. They're, they're just too deep. We need some form of very trusting space to do that. And so that's what psychotherapy does. Psychotherapy tries to get the person moving once again, right? People enter psychotherapy because they're in pain, right? They're hurting in some way. And the reason they're hurting in some way is because they're stuck. They're not moving, they're not growing in their lives. What psychotherapy tries to do is get people to shore up their sense of self, to get it more cohesive, and then to start growing again. And once they're growing again naturally on their own, you stop therapy, and you're off on your own. Well, it turns out this same process of growth of the self also happens with the brain, right? The brain's growth and the self's growth are linked. When our brain's growth stops, we start to feel bad, just as when our own growth stops, we start to feel bad. When the brain growth is going full bore, when our neurogenic rate is high, then we are experiencing a state of radiant brain health, where it feels great just to wake up in the morning and get out of bed and to meet the day. We can hardly wait to just engage with the world. The brain wants to engage the world creatively. And so does the self. Right? It's like being a, a healthy four-year-old, just sort of bounding out of bed once again, where you're in touch with the world. But to do that, it means navigating a neurotoxic minefield of daily life. Um, so we want to work psychologically, and so there's many causes of anxiety, um, for example. Um, anxiety can be due to uh, PTSD, trauma early on can set the nervous system be on high alert and predispose a person to anxiety. And until that early trauma is resolved, the nervous system can't really reset once again and come back to kind of baseline. Um, <clears throat> a very fragile sense of self, a very fragmentation prone self is also subject to anxiety. Freud talked about um, signal anxiety. Signal anxiety is when, say for example, anger is forbidden. It starts to come up in the unconscious and the unconscious defenses go, uh-oh, uh-oh, careful, here comes anger. Red alert, red alert, you feel anxiety, and the unconscious kind of pushes it back down before the person even realizes they've felt it. That's signal anxiety. And a lot of signal anxiety has to do with the self being fragmented. By fragmented, I don't mean like schizophrenic. I mean just the ordinary fragmentation of somebody says something cruel to us, or they put us down in a post, or and we begin to feel bad, right? The early wounding around my sense of value, my self-esteem gets activated. Most people have some degree of early shame, of early feeling of unworthiness, not okayness, some sense of deficiency inside. 
that they protect from and defend against like crazy, but which happens just in daily life. And so some anxiety is simply that, the fear of getting exposed, of that deficiency, of that shameful self being exposed in daily life. Um, poor emotion regulation is another one. Um, so when the baby is crying, right, the mother or the father picks it up and begins to soothe it, begins to see what's wrong. Is the baby lonely? Is the baby cold? Is it wet? Is it hungry? And in the process, the mother or the father holds the baby, strokes the baby, speaks to it in reassuring tones, and conveys to its nervous system, it's okay, you can calm down. It teaches the nervous system of the young infant by touch, by sound, energetically, to calm down. That repeated over and over again, after a while, the infant begins to internalize that. And when the parent isn't around, the child goes, okay, wait a second, it's okay, I can calm down now. I can self-soothe. The capacity to self-soothe is a really important one. Because if that's not developed, then we look to external sources like alcohol or drugs or workaholism or shopping or compulsive something, compulsive eating. Um, so poor emotion regulation is another um, possibility and developing better emotion regulation skills is an important part of therapy. Uh, so there are also um, spiritual dimensions to this as well. Um, you know, there are two major meditation practices which have been shown to have a powerful effect on neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. And spiritual practices also have powerful relaxation responses associated with them. So, <clears throat> Mindfulness practices, for example, have a powerful neurogenic effect, and they also produce great relaxation in the body. Um, similarly, heart opening, compassion practices, have a powerful neurogenic effect on the brain and a very powerful calming effect because we begin to tune into our peaceful center, right? According to all spiritual traditions, the essence of who we are is not just this body, but a spiritual being, a soul or a spirit. And the essence of that is peace, is love. There's a calm, peaceful center at the core of our consciousness. And spiritual practice is a way of beginning to connect to that and allowing that peace then out into our outer being. And interestingly, these practices also are very robust in terms of improving brain health and our neurogenic rate. In fact, along the entire length of the hippocampus, the neurogenic rate speeds way up. And you mentioned something too, kind of uh, on, I guess, kind of the reverse side of that in terms of uh, when when biologically the brain is not working well and the neurogenic rate is, is low, you're talking about the fragmentation of self that occurs. And I wanted to ask you in terms of, you know, someone who is, you know, gone through say, a, you know, experiences, traumatic experiences, uh, I mean, which I guess we all have to some degree, how does kind of, the, the person's biological uh, brain state kind of affect their, their resiliency in terms of, uh, you know, whether they say, you know, a soldier goes to war and someone comes back with PTSD, another soldier doesn't come back with PTSD. Like, do you feel like the, the uh, neurogenic rate and just the biological basis of, of how the brain's functioning is impacting that? Absolutely. 
and in a very big way. Um, our neurogenic rate is the most important biomarker for brain health that most people have never heard of. So <clears throat> when our neurogenic rate slows down, we become anxious at many things. We become much more susceptible to trauma. When our neurogenic rate is high, we get high degrees of emotional resilience, which is the capacity to bounce back from difficulties. And we aren't as knocked over by things as much. You know, anxiety disorders and depression and cognitive decline have been skyrocketing the last 50 years. Um, and it, it, it particularly it, um, affects kids. So childhood rates of depression are five to eight times what they were in the 1960s. And childhood rates of anxiety are eight times what they were in the 1960s. And that's not better testing. That's the exact same standardized tests that were used back then. Plus now we have ADD, ADHD, autism, all the stuff that we hardly even knew back then. So the brain is under assault. And this constant assault creates a kind of weakening of the brain. Its resilience goes way down and we become then more susceptible to all these things, to anxiety. And again, rates of prescriptions for depressants and excuse me, antidepressants um, and anti-anxiety agents are, have also skyrocketed. Um, and depressants are a $16 billion a year industry. Anti-anxiety agents exceed that. Um, it is huge, but unfortunately, these things don't really tend to heal the brain. They tend to suppress the symptoms. What we really want, is sometimes it's important to suppress the symptoms. Sometimes um, antidepressant medication or anti-anxiety medication is a lifesaver when it's used for a small amount of time. But when it's used chronically, then it can create problems. It can be very hard coming off. Um, particularly the benzodiazepines can be extremely addicting and extremely difficult to come off of. So my own sense is that it's really helpful to heal the brain. And here again, we, we come to these four pillars, neurogenic, Meaning there are about, I think, 40 or 50 different herbs and supplements that the book goes into that have a dramatic impact increasing our rate of neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. Similarly, they're important foods to avoid that decrease our rate of neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. Fried foods, for example. Um, create inflammation in the brain, um, chew up the inside of our blood vessels, and dramatically slow down our neurogenic rate. Um, high blood sugar. 80% of the population has some degree of insulin resistance. So the second pillar, ketogenic or low carb, high good fat. You know, a good test for people to get is called the hemoglobin A1C. That's a snapshot of your blood sugar over the last three months. And if you're over 5.0, you would be well to bring that down as soon as possible. For every 0.1 increase, we get a faster rate of cognitive decline. Um, so a ketogenic diet also is being talked about as being neuroprotective. So it's being used with Alzheimer's, with Parkinson's, with epilepsy. The brain as the body can operate with either glucose as fuel or ketone bodies as fuel. And the brain and the body tend to operate more efficiently with ketone bodies. Um, a researcher, um, at Harvard, who recently died, Richard Veach, um, studied the mitochondria of the heart and found that the heart mitochondria operated at 26% greater efficiency with ketone bodies over glucose. 
Now, since the brain, uh, the mitochondria of the brain are similar to that of the heart, it's assumed that the heart also, or that the brain also will operate at 26% greater efficiency. If you can imagine your brain operating at a higher efficiency like that, you have a sense of when you are in nutritional ketosis, you, there's a kind of fundamental clarity. There's a stability to the brain. It's like you're operating on all cylinders. I think it is probably one of the best anti-anxiety and anti-depression and um, cognitive enhancing diets around. It's just a pure ketogenic diet. Um, it's also, a ketogenic diet is also neurogenic. The ketone bodies also stimulate the birth of new neurons. Anti-inflammatory, of course, we need to eat foods that will decrease our inflammation and avoid foods that increase our inflammation. Um, seed oils and vegetable oils, for example, <clears throat> are a disaster. Um, they create high levels of inflammation in the body. Some people think that the current spate of chronic illness is mostly due to seed oils and the high levels of linoleic acid in them. You know, we need a ratio, a good ratio of omega-3 to omega-6s. Omega-3s are like fish oil and also are probably the most important neurogenic supplement you can do. We evolved with a one-to-one -one or one-to-two ratio of omega-3, which is anti-inflammatory, to omega-6, which is inflammatory. The current American diet is about one to 20, which is highly inflammatory, which is again going to massively attack your brain. So we want to decrease foods that have a high linoleic acid content, high omega-6 content. Um, and the book goes into, a, it goes into this in great detail, as well as a number of herbs that you can take that will lower your inflammatory levels. And then gut friendly, we want to repair the tight junctions of the gut. And we want to increase microbial diversity, right? 80% of our neurotransmitters of serotonin, of dopamine, etc., are produced by the microbiome in the gut. And when we have an impaired gut, impaired microbiome, that affects how we feel and how we think. Um, the book goes into a couple of different, actually a number of different probiotics that both heal the gut and then some that have been shown to reduce anxiety levels by 50%, depression levels by 50%, and others that have been shown to improve cognitive performance. Um, but we don't just want to take probiotics. We want to increase the whole microbial environment down there. You know, it used to be thought that we had way more microbes than cells of our bodies. But it turns out we have about the same, about 40 trillion each. There's been a recount done. There are about 20,000 different strains in indigenous cultures. In the West, most people have about 10,000 sometimes as low as a few thousand or even a thousand. <clears throat> That's a disaster for your immune system and it's a disaster for your brain. You wanna increase microbial diversity. And so you wanna eat lots of fiber, just increasing fiber will dramatically increase your microbial diversity. Um, you wanna be in nature and just inhale hundreds of new strains of different um, bacteria. When you're swimming in the ocean, swallow a gulp or two of water. You're taking in hundreds of strains. Um, so we want to be avoiding um, antibiotics whenever possible because that wipes out the microbiome and it comes back at just a fraction of what it was. And we want to take good care of it. We want to eat for it. Um, the uh, uh, 
the doctor used to tell the pregnant woman, you know, you're not just eating for yourself anymore. Well, it's the same here. You're not just eating for yourself. You're eating for 40 trillion. And so we need to have a diet that supports that. How do periods of going without food in cases of fasting, either intermittent fast or prolonged multi-day fast, how does that affect uh, the neurogenic rate and brain health? Good question. Um, <clears throat> so small amounts of stress increase the neurogenic rate. Little higher amounts of stress decrease it. So stress is one of those things where <clears throat> We need this Goldilocks zone of stress of just too little and the neurogenic rate slows down, too much and the neurogenic rate slows down. Um, so we want this, we want moderate and temporary stress, meaning challenges, right? When we are challenged, we respond with some new capacity some new ability, some new part of ourselves to meet that stress or meet that challenge. And we actually become more of who we are as we meet that. And the brain thrives on that. The brain picks up and the brain grows with that. That stimulates growth. So it's the same with fasting. A little bit is good. Um, intermittent fasting is good. Fasting for just a few days seems to be great, um, probably even a week or two, but extended fast beyond that, probably are gonna decrease the neurogenic rate. Um, I don't know the exact number on this. I don't know if it's exactly figured out yet, but too much is not gonna be good for it. And is it, does it kind of the same deal with exercise? Um, so exercise, I mean, Yes, in the sense of too much is, is not good, but there are certain types of exercise which are really good for the neurogenic rate and certain types of exercise that seem to have no effect on it. The best type of exercise to increase your neurogenic rate is aerobic exercise. And aerobic exercise that continues for 20, 30, 40 minutes. Doing high intensity interval training doesn't have any effect on your neurogenic rate. Doing sustained aerobic fitness two, three, four times a week, that is like a miracle grow for your brain. It's like the brain just speeds up. When neuroscientists want to increase the neurogenic rate of rats, they just put a running wheel in the cage and it just speeds right up. Yoga is great for reducing stress. And so in that sense could have some neurogenic get you get a neurogenic boost from that but it doesn't really have any effect on the neurogenic rate um, strength training also seems to have some effect some good effect on the neurogenic rate um i wanted to ask you as far as um, you mentioned there, there being a lot of uh, uh, supplements and herbs that you talk about in your book that, that impact the neurogenic rate. I was just wondering if, if you might be able to share kind of a few of your, your favorite ones. Sure. The number one is omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil. Um, <clears throat> Sandrine There, neuroscientist at the University of London, increased neurogenesis by 40% simply by adding omega-3s to the diet. Um, <clears throat> so omega-3s consist of three fatty acids, ALA, which isn't very important, EPA, which is a good strong anti-inflammatory, and DHA, which is the fundamental building block of the brain. So two thirds of your brain is fat, and a third to a half of that is DHA. It is the fundamental building block of the brain. They did a series of experiments with baby monkeys where they fed half of them a high omega-3 diet and the other half a low omega-3 diet. And then they looked at their brains afterwards. And the low omega-3 diet monkeys 
had very simple, undifferentiated brains. But the high omega-3 diet monkeys had very complex, richly differentiated brains, almost like humans. It is the fundamental, most important building block of the brain. But we also want to make sure that we get our omega-3s in a form that is molecularly distilled so we don't get any mercury with them because fish tend to accumulate mercury and that comes out in many of the omega-3 supplements, which is not good. So you want molecularly distilled. And if you have a high amount of inflammation, you might want a higher EPA to DHA ratio to decrease that inflammation. If you've got good inflammatory levels, you probably want a one-to-one -one EPA to DHA. And most people need three or four grams a day. Um, I think the government suggests three, Life Extension Foundation suggests four. Um, it's hard to get enough just from your diet. Most people need a supplement. Other things would be curcumin. Curcumin is a powerful neurogenic booster and anti-inflammatory. Uh, green tea, we want the equivalent EGCGs in green tea of about 10 to 15 cups a day, but we don't want that much caffeine. So you can get an EGCG extract, caffeine free. That is a very strong neurogenic booster. Um, blueberries, very powerful, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, and pro-neurogenic. Um, the only problem is, although they are the best of the fruits in terms of sugar content, um, you can also do them in the form of um, an extract. So the downside is that they do have some sugar and sugar, actually a high sugar diet will decrease your neurogenic rate by 50%. So know that sugar is not the brain's friend, even though it temporarily likes it. Um, so you can do blueberry extracts um, that are the equivalent of a cup of, a cup of blueberries every day. Um, hesperidin is another favorite of mine. Hesperidin is a bioflavonoid from citrus fruits, and it keeps brand new baby brain cells alive, right? Unless we use our new brain cells, about 50% of them will die off pretty quickly, unless you do something like hesperidin. And hesperidin is not terribly bioavailable, but if you do it in the form of methyl chalcone, it's eight times more bioavailable. So that's a good form to do it in. There's, again, the book goes into many others as well, but those are probably some of the top ones. Dr. Courtright, do you have any specific uh, examples of, of patients that you've worked with, which maybe you've worked with them to implement some of these uh, changes to, you know, it really increase their neurogenic rate and remove some of these environmental uh, toxins and pollutants that are, that are damaging their brains, and then kind of how that impacted their, their psychology and their ability to uh, either not be controlled by kind of the, their past programming or maybe their ability to, to go in with psychotherapy and reprogram. Mm -hmm. Do you have any specific examples that really come to mind? Sure. Um, <clears throat> one thing I noticed early on was that many of my most fragile patients were vegans. And I think it's very difficult to have a healthy diet on a vegan diet. Um, you're missing some important nutrients like B12, for example, that are really important for the brain. And you're also missing a lot of saturated fats, which are really helpful for the brain. And you're missing omega-3s, unless you get them from algae. So I was able to, after a while, interest this person in experimenting with a non-vegan diet and re radically increasing her omega-3 intake, um, doing a lot of anti-inflammatory, just getting on the whole program. And 
it almost felt like the therapy began to take off at that point. It's like before there was so much anxiety and so much shame and so much um, defensiveness whenever certain things would come up that it was difficult to work. But we then got to work on some of her early relational wounds around her mom in particular. And after a year or two, she was just sailing through graduate school. She came out in, in great shape. Um, and the fragility left. She became actually kind of rock solid. There was, there was a really strong person underneath all of that fragility. And when her brain became more, became stronger, and when herself became more cohesive, she just took off. It was a joy to see. Well, Dr. Courtright, we're coming up on to the end of the show. I've really enjoyed uh, this discussion. Any, any last thoughts related to anything related to the neurogenic rate or psychology, the biology, the brain that, that you feel like is really important to leave listeners with? Um, maybe just that I, I think... Um, Dickens was right when he said it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. That it's the same thing with the brain now. It's never been worse in terms of all the neurotoxins that are out there. At the same time, it's never been better because we've never known really how to increase our neurogenic rate until now. We've never known how to heal the gut, how to reduce inflammation, how to really operate at a much higher level. And so it takes work. It takes some degree of educating ourselves about what to avoid and what directions to move in. Um, we can't just trust what feels good. I, I think it was Carl Rogers years ago who pointed out that if you leave babies alone, they eat a perfectly balanced diet, unless you throw in sugar and then it throws it way off. Um, we need to use our brains to figure out really how we're going to eat, how we're going to exercise. Um, we can't just rely on what tastes good or what is readily available when we walk into the store. We really need to use our brain in order to get our brain to be working better and better and better. Well, Dr. Courtright, if people want to find out more about your work, or uh, read some of your books, where would you direct them to? Um, well, you go to my Amazon author page, um, or you could go to my website, which is brantcourtright.com. Um, again, the, the recent book is Holistic Healing for Anxiety, Depression, and Cognitive Decline. And I think most of this is in there. Awesome. And for the listeners who enjoyed the show today, go ahead and like and subscribe to our YouTube channel or Roscoe's Wetsuit Neuro. You can find all full episodes of the podcast along with podcast clips on that channel. Also, go ahead and subscribe on whatever audio platform that you listen to podcasts, whether that be Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, we are on them all. Dr. Courtright, again, I wanted to really thank you for coming on and having this fascinating discussion today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.